Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author, Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. I'm going to minister in the next few moments on the subject of unlocking the Yom Kippur cycle. Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 28 says this, And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, and you shall do no work on that same day. For this is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord. I will go over a few things in the next few minutes that most of this crowd and most of my television audience will be familiar with. God, in the time of Moses, established seven festivals that are celebrated every year at the same month at the same time time. Because the Jewish calendar was lunar solar, it did not always fall on the same actual month. For example, spring feast fall in March or April, uh, the Pentecost feast falls in May or June, and the fall festivals fall usually around September or October. So here's what they are. You know them. Passover followed by unleavened bread, followed by first fruits, followed by Pentecost, followed by trumpets, then followed by the Day of Atonement, followed by tabernacles. Now, in the fulfillment of these festivals, and this is what I want to show you, and then I will share with you a statement my wife gave me. Passover was the time of Christ's crucifixion. That represents our justification in God. Unleavened bread was Christ's sinless life. He died and knew no sin. That represents our sanctification, where we are set free from the power of sin. First fruits is Christ's resurrection. That represents our glorification. As he was raised, so we will be raised. So we are justified, we are sanctified, and we are glorified in the future. Pentecost represents the Holy Spirit and the church because in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. That's our baptism in the Holy Ghost. Then there's trumpets, and this is how I teach this, and this is where the controversy came in with my wife. I teach that the three fall festivals, which are trumpets, followed 10 days later by atonement, followed five days later by tabernacles, are festivals that deal with the rapture, the tribulation period, and the coming kingdom. And when we talk about the festival of trumpets at the rapture, that's when we enter into our rest, our eternal rest. Atonement represents the tribulation when the world is going to be judged, and tabernacles represents the future kingdom of the Messiah when Jesus will come back to rule and reign on earth for 1,000 years. So my wife has heard me for quite some time say this, the fall festivals by and large have not yet been fulfilled, but will be fulfilled in the future. The other day, in fact it was a few weeks ago, and this is what inspired this message. My wife came to me as we were discussing something. She said, you know, you have friends, and I have some very good friends. I respect these men. I won't call their name from the pulpit, however. But I have some friends that believe in pre-trib. They believe that the Lord will be coming in the middle of the tribulation period, the tribulation period being seven years, mid-trib being right in the middle at some point. There are others that believe in post-trib. I have some very dear friends who believe in post-trib, which literally means that they believe Jesus will return at the very end of the tribulation in Revelation chapter 19, and they go to Matthew 24 and talk about the angels gathering the elect, and they teach it's the church. I teach it's Israel, but they teach it's the church. Now, my wife has heard me talk about trumpets is the rapture. She heard me talk about that atonement is the tribulation, and tabernacles is the kingdom. And I've taught this. I have said we are right now living at Pentecost. We are living in what we call the church age. We are living in the outpouring of the Spirit. In fact, since Jesus went back to heaven, we've been at Pentecost, the birth of the church and the outpouring of the Spirit. We've not come technically to another feast yet. The next feast we're going to come to is trumpets. If that's, if I'm correct, that would be a picture of the rapture. It hasn't happened yet, so we're headed there. But again, I say to you that we are in the dispensation of the grace of God. We are in what we would call the church age by some theologians, and the church age climaxes with the gospel being preached around the world, then the end comes. Who's preaching the gospel? The church is preaching the gospel. 
gospel, then when we do our assignment the way we're supposed to, and when the Holy Spirit is poured out around the world, God will be finished with the dispensation of the church age, and they will come into the wrath of God. So that's why I say trumpets and atonement. All right, my wife came to me, and I'm going to, I'm going to share with you what she said to me, and I'm going to try to explain it the way she did. She says, now, Perry, I'm going to ask you a question. She said, you believe that trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles are going to be future fulfilled. I said, that's right. She said, but you also have taught people that on the day of atonement, Jesus Christ died on the cross, and just like there were three red threads used on the day of atonement, there were three crosses. I said, that's right. And I'm going to explain this a little further. And she starts saying, so what you're saying is atonement has already been fulfilled through Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And I said, said, now, wait a minute. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. She said, but wait a minute. You're saying that atonement is going to be the judgment coming to the earth. And I'll explain this in a minute as I'm, I'm sharing this with you. And I said, it is going to be the judgment. She says, but at the same time, how can you say that atonement was fulfilled partially in Jesus, and yet you're telling people it's partially going to be fulfilled later? She says, there's not many festivals that you can say prophetically are going to have a double fulfillment. Passover doesn't have a double fulfillment. It's one thing, Jesus' crucifixion. My wife is so smart. I just hate it when she gets like this. And no, I really don't. I love it. And, and, then, and then unleavened bread basically was Christ in the tomb. Uh, first fruits is his resurrection. Paul talks about that. Pentecost is the church and the Holy Spirit. It's nothing else. And so I'm, I'm saying to myself, uh-oh, she's got me on this one. And she wanted me to show in the Bible because here was her, Frank, Frank Book sitting there grinning because he, he, he's mid-trib. He's on my board and he's mid-trib. I, I told him, I said, when Jesus comes, I'm going to wave goodbye to you, boy, when you're down here waiting for me. <laughs> So he's on my board. So we've talked, we've talked about these things. I, I'm almost convinced him, but not totally yet. Now, here's, here's her point. She says, Perry, if Jesus did fulfill atonement, if he's fulfilled Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, which he did, the church has fulfilled Pentecost. This is the order, right? I'm in the order. That's the first four. So the trumpets is coming. But if Jesus fulfilled atonement, then all you got is two festivals left, which is trumpets and tabernacles. I said, woman, she says, now you know what that means? Trumpets is the coming of the Lord, tabernacles is the kingdom. It means how do you know the post-trip people aren't right? Because Jesus comes back, then he sets up his kingdom at the end of the tribulation, so you just told the post-trip people they're wrong. Now look, it would take my wife to figure something like this out. She's the woman that never talks. She's the woman that sits and listens to me preach. She don't take notes. She don't take notes in the Bible. And here I am revelating on prophecy. I am writing a book. I had her read the book, and she had to bring this up. So I am not going to let that woman get the best of me. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Does, is everybody tracking with me right now? So here's what I want to do. If Jesus fulfilled all of atonement, she's right. It's trumpets, tabernacles, which is Jesus coming, setting up the kingdom. That puts you at post-trip. But if I can show you that the only festival that has to have biblically a double fulfillment is atonement, then my order is correct and I can answer her question. Those of you watching on Manifest, you're going to get 21 minutes of this, and everybody else is going to get 70. Sorry you weren't here to get the 70, and I'm only going to show one episode of this. But here we go. Let's go with it. Are you ready? Y'all looking at me like, this crowd looks scared right now. This is the first time I've ever preached here with my partners, and they're like looking at me like, where are you going with this? I'm going to show you where I'm going. Now, on the Day of Atonement, it happened, you have trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. The Day of Atonement happened on the seventh month and the tenth day. And I'm going to give you some stuff that most of you already know. On the Day of Atonement, there were two identical goats that were offered. One goat is marked for the Lord, and they do it through a lottery by reaching their hand in a box and praying. With a, if it says, for the Lord, that's the goat for the Lord. Over here is another goat, and that goat is called, called for Azazel. Azazel is believed to be an old name of a fallen angel or an evil spirit. So one goat will die on the altar for the Lord, and one will die as Azazel. Now, the reason I'm saying that to you is because 
because there were two different people connected heavily in the crucifixion story. These goats had to be identical. And a matter of fact, there were two people in the crucifixion story, and one is called Jesus and the other is called Barabbas. So in other words, one goat had, it, had a, uh, its hands laid on it and was put on the altar and died. That's Jesus. The other goat called the scapegoat had its hands put on it and had the sins transferred on it. Sin remained on it. And the priest would take it into the wilderness where they would eventually push it off a cliff and it would meet its death at the bottom. Now, the reason I'm sharing that with you is I want to talk for a moment about this man named Barabbas, Bar Abbas. He's mentioned in the Bible. The Bible tells us that Jesus' name was Yeshua. That's the Hebrew name, Yeshua. Yeshua the Christos, Yeshua Christos, Yeshua the Christ. However, there is some early church evidence that Barabbas' Barabbas's name was Yeshua bar Abbas. Yeshua bar Abbas meaning the son of Abbas or the son of the father. His name meant son of the father. So you got Jesus, Yeshua, the son of the father, and you've got bar Abbas, Yeshua, the son of the father. That's what his name meant. meant in, in, in early church fathers and also biblical history, he was a rebel, he was a murderer, and he caused what's called an insurrection. Early fathers say that Barabbas was killing apostate rulers, and he had a big group of men that were going around assassinating people they thought that were apostates. Some even suggest that he was being followed as a Messiah. Now, how weird is that? You have the true Messiah being crucified, and you have Yeshua Barabbas that many of the people think he's the Messiah. This is why the crowd scream, give us Barabbas. He was known. Now, think about this. This changes that whole scene of the crucifixion. Fiction. If a bunch of people in that crowd thought Barabbas was a Messiah because he was taking on the leadership and assassinating the leaders that were wrong, and you've got Jesus, who some people know that he's the Messiah, you've got the battle of a real Messiah and a false Messiah going on in the crowd that day. How amazing is that? Three red threads were used on the Day of Atonement. Uh, one was tacked to the temple door, one was tied around the horn of the goat for the Lord, and the neck of the one, or the neck of the goat for, for the Lord, and the horn of the one that was called Ezazel. When the high priest shoved that goat off the cliff and it hit the bottom, that's when the red thread on the temple door, according to Jewish tradition, turned completely white. Now, having said that, that's the procedure on the Day of Atonement. Oddly enough, the high priest would say, it is done once everything was completed and he saw the red thread on the temple door, tor door turned white. Why is that important? Because in the book of Revelation, when the seventh angel is pouring out the vial, what does the angel say? There's a major earthquake and it is done. Oh, don't get, y'all, you got to get the parallels here. Jesus the Messiah is dying on a cross. Barabbas the false Messiah has been released. Jesus is the goat for the Lord. Barabbas is the scapegoat. He's escaping, but he still is a sinner. He hasn't dealt with his sin issue. As Jesus dies on the cross, he says, it is finished. When he says it is, it is finished, an earthquake happens and the veil is torn. The seventh angel in the book of Revelation, whoo, there's a major earthquake that happens, and this angel said, it is done. It is a picture in Revelation of the atonement judgment. It is a picture of the day of atonement. There's parallels running here. Now, is everybody still tracking with me? Say, I am. Well, here we go. Now, why would I say that there are still future patterns on the day of atonement when, obviously, Jesus fulfilled so many of the patterns? For example, you got to follow me here. The Day of Atonement in Israel today, as well as in biblical history, was the Day of Judgment on all levels of people in Israel. Atonement, however, don't miss this. This is where we're going. Atonement, however, is also the time when the Jubilee is announced. It makes no sense. Oh, I'm about to plow now. You, you, you prophecy people are going to eat this up. You see, I would think that if God is going to start a jubilee, you count seven years times seven years and 49 years, then you blow a silver trumpet. What's the festival of trumpets? It's the blowing of trumpets. You should be declaring a jubilee on the Jewish New Year of Rosh Hashanah on the day of trumpets, and God doesn't do it that way. God says on the 10th day of the seventh month, you will declare a jubilee Guess what day that is? Day of Atonement, which is supposed to be the day of judgment. He doesn't do it on the normal New Year. 
He does it on the day that's supposed to be the day of judgment. Therefore, well, the day of atonement has two themes, judgment and jubilee. Somebody's going to get this in a minute and hoop and holler with me the way I did when I start seeing this. All right? The first thing I want to do is look at the judgment aspect of atonement. The day of atonement was the one day when God says to Israel, afflict your souls. You fast the entire day. Animals can't eat. Children can't eat. Women can't eat. They made an exception for pregnant women later on, but you can't eat. Now, here's what happens. Individual and national judgment happens on the day of atonement because God is looking at the high priest and he's looking at the Levite and then he's looking at the common people. The entire nation of Israel has to come under what's called self-evaluation on the day of atonement. The day of atonement is a time that had a lot of fear. The people had a lot of fear of God, a lot of fear of how is God going to view us. Jewish rabbis note that there were three people in Israel and still are today on the day of atonement. The totally righteous who had served God all year long. The totally unrighteous that hadn't served God at all for the entire year. And the in-between who were kind of borderline. They wanted to do right. They'd do right every now and then. Then they wouldn't do right. And they'd do right. And they wouldn't do right. And so there were three groups of people. So what has to happen is God then rewards the totally righteous for their obedience by forgiving their sins and blessing them for the next year. God then says to the totally unrighteous, if you don't get right with me, I will judge you in the coming year. Then God says to those in between, it's time for you to make the choice. If you're on the Lord's side, be on the Lord's side. If you're not on the Lord's side, don't be on the Lord's side. So they have to make a decision, as Elijah would say, why halt between two opinions? Serve God if he is God. Now, again, I want to mention this. They afflict or chasten their soul. Four times in Leviticus where it talks about the Day of Atonement, it talks about the afflicting or the chastening of the soul. It is not a feast day. It is a fast day. It is a day of repentance. And on this day, you will either be released from your sin or you will be condemned by your sin. And this is where in the book of Revelation, let me show you the parallel, okay? In the book of Revelation, there are people who are making their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. They were not ready for the return of the Lord, and they had to fall before God and repent. And many of them in Revelation 6 will die martyrs. Revelation 20, they'll die by beheading. That's one group. So there's a group that was ready, who are ready to go when the Lord comes, and they're the ones I call them rapture ready. There's another group that wasn't ready, that they have to make their robes white in Revelation 7. And there's another group, read it, that does not repent. And men repented not of their sorceries, their murders, their thievery, their fornication. They would not repent. So that's the, you see the three groups on the Day of Atonement, righteous, unrighteous, in between. You see them in the book of Revelation. The righteous that have been taken, the unrighteous that have to, that, that don't repent, and those in between sometimes that will make their robes white with the blood of the Lamb. If everybody's got it so far, clap your hands and say, I've got God is so far. Now, we're going to show you something. The Day of Atonement has to have a double fulfillment. It has to have a judgment fulfillment, and it also has to have a jubilee fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Now, this festival having a double fulfillment is explained, first of all, this way. The first fulfillment is Jesus fulfilling the Day of Atonement as a lamb. The next fulfillment will be Jesus fulfilling the Day of Atonement as a lion. Because you know as well as I do that he shed his blood as the Lamb of God, John 1, 29, I believe it is, to bring atonement to mankind to justify us of our sins. So, on the day of on Passover, he was atoning for us. And that's why on Passover, at his death and crucifixion, you see pictures of the Day of Atonement. The three crosses, the three threads, the two goats, Jesus and Barabbas. That's why the parallel is there. Now, however, when he comes as the Lion of Judah, he's going to come not to justify the nations, but to judge the nations. The Bible calls him in Revelation the Lion 
men of the tribe of Judah. Now, this is where we get into the alpha and omega of the Greek alphabet. The alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. The omega is the very last letter. In fact, if you want to know what omega looks like, look at the wall of OCI. That's the omega emblem. Last letter of the Greek alphabet. Jesus came the first time as the alpha. He's coming at the end as the omega because he said, I am alpha and omega. I am the beginning and the end. So we see that. Now, what I want to do here is I want to look at the aspect of Jubilee from Jesus' day. Now, you've heard me preach this on Manifest. This is an old message, so I'm going to go old school on you here. But if you've never heard this, it's exciting. In Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2 is a great prophecy about the coming Messiah. It reads... The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. When Jesus preached his first sermon at age 30 after his 40-day fast, he went to Nazareth and went to the synagogue where he was raised. They brought him the scroll of the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah, by the way, is huge. And you had spindles and you had to turn it to find the place. He found what is in our Bible, Isaiah 61. Now, in the scroll, there's no verses or there's no chapter headings. You have to know the book to find it. So Jesus reads Isaiah's prophecy. Now let me read to you from Luke chapter 418 the way Jesus said this in his day when he preached his first sermon. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, period. Then he says, this day is this verse fulfilled in your hearing. Now, I studied this as a kid, and I noticed something. Jesus completely omitted the last part of Isaiah 61. He purposely did not quote this, and the day of vengeance of our God. He didn't quote that. Now, here's the reason why, and here's what you've got to understand. When he came as the lamb, he did not come to bring vengeance. A woman was caught in adultery, and instead of stoning her by the law, he forgives her and tells her, go and sin no more. Jesus starts touching lepers, which is forbidden by the traditions of the Jews. Jesus starts doing things that are so different. The poor have the gospel preached. So Jesus, the first time, did not come to bring wrath, vengeance, or destruction on anything. So he only said, I'm now come to preach the acceptable mm -hmm, year of the Lord. What is the phrase, the acceptable year of the Lord? Ready? If you've not heard it, it's true. In Judaism, the acceptable year of the Lord is the year of the Jubilee. So Jesus is actually saying, this day is the Jubilee fulfilled in your hearing. They went crazy. They took him on the edge of the city, tried to push him off a cliff because they said, what do you mean? Now, here's how they're thinking. What does he mean, Jubilee? Jubilee has to be counted 49 plus 40, 49 years and every 50 years. What does he mean saying he has come to preach the Jubilee? Jesus was actually saying, get ready now, the Jubilee is no longer a 49-year count. I have come to become the Jubilee, to set the captive free, to bring deliverance to those who are blind and bound. What you saw a moment ago was only about a 21 to 22 minute excerpt of a message I preached at the main event. And now I want to make available to you that complete message and eight other messages that we have available on audio CD or DVD. The CDs are nine messages, five messages that I spoke, plus four powerful guest speakers of just the message. The DVDs, however, contain the message of all nine speakers, plus music, and sometimes a portion of the altar service. So you make the choice, but whatever you do, get these CDs and DVDs because this is our most requested offer every year, the main event where thousands of people and partners come together. Very quickly, let me share with you what you're going to receive. Here are a list of the message titles with the speaker. I preached on, I'm not leaving until I see what he promised me. 
Michael Wood preached one of the greatest messages I've ever heard called the one word that can change everything. Then I preached on when God takes up your slack in time of lack. If you've been having financial difficulty, you need to listen to this one. Tony Stewart preached a powerful word called miracles when you stand in the threshold. I came back with what I believe to be the most right now word for America, removing the enemy's gag order on the church. There are people in America attempting to silence the church. I'm going to expose it and tell you how to reverse it. Chris Hill preached, I'm already there. I preached then a message called Unlocking the Yom Kippur Cipher, one of our great prophetic messages of this year. Then Mark Casto preached when God cast the last net and I concluded with a Saturday night message. The Lord changed my message and gave me a now word called what the Lord has showed me about this prophetic season. Now you can get all nine of these on CD or DVD. Now, if you want to order the audio CDs, it's 15 ME CD and the nine DVDs are 15 ME DVD. And for a gift of $55 or more, you can order the CDs. And for a gift of $95 or more, you can order the DVDs. Now there's three ways of ordering, perrystone.org or 188821 bread or Perry Stone PO Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320. Go right now and order your set of the special main event messages. The message you saw just a portion of was decoding the Yom Kippur Cypher. And I'm telling you something, this was one of the most powerful insights that God had given me this year. And if you heard the beginning of the message, it was my wife that stirred me into thinking about this. Uh, the question she asked me about the fall festivals was, it's like, hey, <laughs> pay attention. And uh, I want you to hear the conclusion of it because uh, it's about 70 minutes in length and it goes into an explanation. I can tell you, if you listen to this entire message, it absolutely proves the order of events and a pre-tribulation rapture. I think it's undeniable. You gotta hear the whole thing. You know, people hear a bit in a piece and they write me a letter. Well, I heard you say this and they didn't hear the whole thing. So you can't judge something until you hear all of it, okay? So anyway, CDs and DVDs are now available through our office or 1-888-21 bread. I'll get it there in a minute. So go ahead and make your plans to get either the CDs or DVDs of the messages. We also, uh, are, as you know, have some great things planned in 2016. Let me just give you briefly the, the itinerary uh, that we're going to be having. On Sunday, January the 17th at 1030 and 6 p.m., I'm coming to Evangel Temple Assembly of God in Jacksonville, Florida for one day only. That'll be Sunday. On Sunday night, January 24th, the church on Strayer in Miami, Ohio, Pastor Tony Scott's church, a special meeting one night there. Jan uh, Friday through Sunday is the Awaken America Conference. Friday night, two services Saturday and Sunday morning, OCI Omega Center International, Dutch Sheets, myself and Mark Casto, and hundreds and hundreds of intercessors are coming together for that. February the 7th, we're going to Trinity All Good in All Good, Tennessee, 8.30 and 10.30. We're coming to Covenant Life Worship Center in Chickamauga, Georgia, Saturday night at 6. Remnant will be with me there and Sunday at 10.30. And then Free Chapel, Orange County, February 19th through the 21st. And then Free Chapel, Spartanburg, South Carolina. You heard it here first. On March the 4th through the 6th, I'm coming to South Carolina. I want the place jammed out with men and women. We've not been to South Carolina except for the Church of God camp meeting. And now I'm coming to Free Chapel in Spartanburg in March. I cannot wait. This I'm excited about this. So perrystone.org will have the full itinerary if you'd like to go there and see where we're coming to. A lot of things are happening. Uh, just recently, and it was uh, just a very uh, powerful circumstance that caused this to happen, we've obtained a brand new facility in town for a future ministry project that we're involved with. I'll be telling you more about that as the time passes. Thank you for your prayers and support. We need it to keep manifest on the air. God bless you.